Well, good afternoon. Are you having a blessed Sabbath? Isn't it wonderful to have fellowship one with another? I think it's great. Get acquainted with people from different places, study the word, sing praises to the Lord. I mean, have a good meal. Did you eat well? Hopefully not too well. This is a difficult time because it's right at, kind of right after lunch. But uh, we want to study the lesson that we find on page 249. The title is The Millennium Changing the Ordinance. Now, we're going back from the topic that we studied this morning. Because this morning we studied about uh, the holy city after sin is eradicated. But um, I want to go back now and deal with another one that has to do with the millennium. Uh, and so before we do, we want to have a word of prayer. And then uh, we'll study this lesson. Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessings that we've received this day. How wonderful it is to gather as a church family and as people from all places in the United States to study your word and to fellowship together. It's just a little foretaste of what it's going to be like when we get to heaven. Only all of the redeemed will be present there. We're going to have a long time to get acquainted with everyone. And we look forward to that. Be with us this afternoon as we open your word. Help us to understand the importance of what we're going to study. That we might share it with those who are searching for answers. We thank you for the privilege of coming before your throne boldly. And we do so because we come in the name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Some Old Testament scholars have referred to Isaiah 24 to 27 as the little book of revelation of the Old Testament or the little apocalypse of the Old Testament. And the reason why is because there are many similarities in Isaiah 24 to 27 that we find with particularly the sections in Revelation that deal with controversy and conflict. And so we are going to take a look at one particular verse in Isaiah chapter 24, and it's verse 6. But uh, first of all, we want to see what historical occasion is being described in Isaiah chapter 24. So let's begin at the bottom of the page where it says Isaiah 24, 17 to 23. We've read this before, but now we want to read it again uh, in another context. It says, fear and the pit and the snare are upon you, O inhabitant of the earth. And it shall be that he who flees from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit. And he who comes up from the midst of the pit shall be caught in the snare. For the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth are shaken. The earth is violently broken. The earth is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall totter like a hut. Its transgression shall be heavy upon it, and it will fall and not rise again. At least it's not going to rise again the way it was before. It shall come to pass in that day, and this is what we studied last night, it will come to pass in that day that the Lord will punish on high the host of the exalted ones, and on the earth the kings of the earth. They will be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and will be shut up in the prison and after many days they will be punished. Then the moon will be disgraced and the sun ashamed for the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his elders gloriously. So below this we have the summary that this passage contains. So let's review the summary so that we are clear on the historical context because we're going to go to verses 5 and 6 in this context. First of all, in these verses, we have a global catastrophe or cataclysm, which is the second coming of Christ. At this time, God punishes Satan and his angels and the wicked kings of the earth and by shutting them up in what? In prison. That is, they're shut up in this earth. Satan and his angels alive and the wicked all dead. They remain in prison for how long? They remain in prison for many days, which is equivalent to how many years in Revelation? To a thousand years. 
after the thousand years, there will be a second and final stage of punishment. Is that clear that they have two stages of punishment? After the punishment is meted out, which is they will be thrown into the fire and consumed, Satan will be reduced to ashes, as will the wicked. Then you see the new Jerusalem and Mount Zion come to view, just like in the book of Revelation. In the city the sun and moon are ashamed, and then God will reign in Jerusalem and on Zion before his ancients gloriously. That's when God makes a new heavens and a new earth. The capital of the kingdom will be the new Jerusalem. So we've gone from events before the millennium, then to events during the millennium when they're in prison, and events after the millennium when the holy city is seen and God will reign forever and ever before his ancients or before his elders as some versions read. Now the question is, why was the earth destroyed in this manner? Why did the earth split apart? Why did it shake and totter like a drunkard? Well, Isaiah 24 and verses 5 and 6 explain the reason. The earth mourns and fades away. The world languishes and fades away. The haughty people of the earth languish. Languish. The earth is also defiled under its inhabitants. So why was the earth defiled under its inhabitants? Three reasons are now given. Notice. First of all, because they have what? Transgressed the laws. So in other words, the reason why the earth mourns and fades away, the world languishes and fades away, the reason why the earth is defiled under the inhabitants is because of, first of all, they have transgressed the laws. Second, what did they do? They changed, that word is very interesting, they changed the ordinance, ordinance in singular. It's a singular ordinance. And then, number three, they have broken the everlasting covenant. So summarizing the three reasons why the earth was defiled and why the earth was destroyed is because they transgressed the laws, they changed the ordinance, and they broke the everlasting covenant. And so what is the consequence of this? Let's read verse 6. Therefore, the curse has devoured the earth, and those who dwell in it are desolate. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men are left. Those are the ones that are not burned, according to what we studied last night. So notice, the consequences of transgressing the laws, changing the ordinance, singular, and breaking the everlasting covenant is that the curse has devoured the earth because of these three reasons. Now let's take these three reasons in order. The first is that they have transgressed the laws. Now what is the meaning of that? Which laws? Well, let's go to Nehemiah chapter 9 and we'll read verse 13 and verse 14. Nehemiah 9, 13 and 14. This is speaking about God coming down to Mount Sinai and revealing his law. It says, you came down also on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them just ordinances and true laws, good statutes and commandments. And then notice this, you made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses, your servant. So what is the meaning of true laws? God came down, he revealed ordinances, he revealed true laws, good statutes, and commandments. Now listen carefully to what I'm going to say. The change of the ordinance cannot refer to the ceremonial law. Are you understanding what I'm saying? 
When Isaiah says that the reason, one of the reasons why the earth totters like a drunkard, why the earth is destroyed, it says because they changed the ordinance. It cannot be an ordinance from the ceremonial law. Why not? Because God is not going to condemn the world for violating a ceremonial law that was nailed to the cross. Are you following me or not? It has to be a perpetual ordinance. Because if it's a part of the ceremonial law, that was nailed to the cross. The ceremonial law, because it will be fulfilled in Christ. And at the end, God isn't going to punish the world because they transgressed the ceremonial law. Are you understanding my point? And so this must deal with a moral law, not with the ceremonial laws. Incidentally, the Syriac version, which is a very ancient version, and the Septuagint, that is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, as well as the Chaldee version, renders the word Torah in singular. In other words, they say they transgress the law. Now I believe that that would be a better translation because there is one specific commandment that is mentioned in Nehemiah chapter 9. What is that commandment that is mentioned? You made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them precepts, statutes, laws by the hand of Moses, your servant. So, in other words, what we find here is that God is going to condemn the world the world is going to become corrupted and it's going to be destroyed for the first reason because they transgress the laws or perhaps the singular, they transgress the law and the Sabbath is specifically mentioned. Now let me ask you, what is sin? Well, notice on the next page, I think everybody knows this. First John chapter 3 and verse 4 says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is what? Sin is the transgression of the law. By the way, transgression of the law translates one Greek word. The Greek for law is nomos. And when you put an A next to nomos, anomias, it means transgressor of the law. So in other words, the word that is used here is properly translated in the King James Version that sin is a transgression of the law. Other modern versions translate that sin is lawlessness. Well, that's not a terrible translation, but I prefer transgression of the law. Sin means breaking God's law. Let me ask you, in the end time, is that going to characterize the world? Notice Matthew chapter 24 and verse 12. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 12. I want to underline again before we read this verse that this cannot be referring to the ceremonial law. In the end time, God's not going to condemn the world for disobeying an ordinance of the ceremonial law because the ceremonial law was nailed to the cross. If God is condemning the world for, uh, for changing an ordinance and for transgressing the law, they must be perpetual ordinances and they must be perpetual what? They must be perpetual laws. Notice Matthew 24, 12. This is speaking about the end time. And because lawlessness, that word lawlessness is the identical word in 1 John 3, 4, where it says sin is transgression of the law. So you could very, trans very well translate, and because of the transgression of the law will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Let me ask you, can something grow cold that was not hot before? Huh? No. So must this be referring to people who perhaps once walked in the Lord's way? Absolutely. Because it says, the love of many will grow cold. In fact, Ellen White has several statements, and they're in your uh, study notes in a different place, where she clearly says, that this verse applies to people who were church members and yet did not uh, persevere in their walk with the Lord Jesus. Now the next verse indicates the same thing. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 23. 
the previous two verses say that in that day many will say Lord Lord did we not cast out demons in your name did they claim to be Christians yes or no yes they're doing it in the name of Jesus Lord Lord did we not prophesy in your name did they profess Jesus Lord Lord did we not perform miracles in your name did they profess to be Christians yes and what is Jesus going to say to them Matthew 7 and verse 23 and then I will declare to them I never knew you depart from me you who practice lawlessness you could, this could be translated depart from me you who transgress the law is the law going to be a prime problem at the end of time is it going to be a point of controversy yes Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17 says the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed and what is it that enrages the dragon the remnant does what they keep the commandments of God and the third angel's message mentions the same thing so transgressing the law must refer to a transgression of what of the Ten Commandments and if the word is singular like is in these ancient versions then it would be a particular commandment in the law of God and the Sabbath is mentioned in Nehemiah chapter 9 notice Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8 Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8 the wicked end time generation will stand in contrast to Jesus who hated lawlessness because the law was in his heart notice Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8 but to the son he says your throne O God is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness once again it's the same word anomias that appears in 1st John chapter 3 and verse 4 you have hated the transgression of the law therefore God your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companion and by the way 2nd Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7 refers to the end time antichrist as the man of lawlessness and it's the same word anomias the man who teaches people to transgress the law which commandment particularly will the end time antichrist teach people to transgress the sabbath commandment who is this man of sin it represents the papacy the same as the little horn the same as the beast the same as the harlot the same as the antichrist of first john the same as the king of the north all of those symbols point to the same system which is the papacy that says that we should keep Sunday in honor of the resurrection when the Bible tells us that the Sabbath is the day that we are supposed to keep now what about the second reason why the world is defiled and why God will destroy the world the second reason is that they changed what they changed the ordinance singular not ordinances the ordinance let me ask you could that refer to the ordinances of the ceremonial law no for the same reason that transgressing the law or the laws could not be a transgression of the ceremonial laws because I repeat once again the ceremonial laws came to an end at the cross God would not punish the people at the end of time for transgressing regulations that ended at the cross are you with me or not these must be moral commandments in other words now what does the word change mean here well it's translated in Genesis 31 verse 7 do you remember what Laban did you know Laban was a real wicked guy he was a conniving guy and Jacob complained in Genesis 1, uh, 31 verse 7 because Laban changed his salary how many times ten times notice changing the salary is the identical same word that appears in Isaiah chapter 24 another place where the word changed appears is with Joseph when before he appeared before Pharaoh 
he actually changed his garments. Once again, it, the translation changed is a proper translation. By the way, the Hebrew word is also translated abolish, and it is also translated alter. Not like an altar in the sanctuary. Alter means what? To change. And so the word change simply means that something was altered. Something was abolished. Something was changed in the law of God. Now what is the meaning, the root meaning of the word ordinance? Lexicographers, that is those who are experts at defining biblical words, tell us that the original Hebrew root of the word hok means, listen carefully, to scratch or engrave, cutting in or engraving in stone. Did you catch that? I'll read it again. It means to scratch or engrave, cutting in or engraving in stone. Where were the Ten Commandments written? On tables of stone. Thus, according to the Hebrew scholars, the original root means to engrave laws, this is them speaking now, to engrave laws upon slabs of stone or metal to set them in a public place. Are you starting to catch a picture? According to the Brown, Driver, and Briggs Hebrew lexicon, which is one of the most reputable uh, Hebrew dictionaries of the Old Testament, the word means to cut in, to cut upon, to engrave, to inscribe, to trace, and to mark out. What was it that was engraved? What was it that was scratched in or cut upon on the tables of stone? It was the Ten Commandments. So is there going to be a power that will change the ordinance, singular? Yes. What change would that be? That would be the change of what? Of the Holy Sabbath, one of the Ten Commandments. Now the word chok appears accompanied by other words for law in the Old Testament, such as the, the word word, testimony, law, judgment, and commandment. All of these are pretty close to being synonymous. I want to read from Vine's Expository Dictionary of Biblical Words what the word ordinance means. The word's synonyms are mitzvah, commandment, mishpat, judgment, berit, covenant, Torah, law, and adut, testimony. It is not easy to distinguish between these synonyms as they are often found in conjunction with each other. Now the big question is, what does the word chok refer to? We notice that it has to do with engraving something, with inscribing or cutting upon something in tables of stone or perhaps tables of metal. Now this word is very interesting. It is used very frequently in the Old Testament to describe ordinances that God established at creation. You say, really? Absolutely. Notice Proverbs 8, 29. Did God establish that the sea would not go out of its bounds when God created, when he separated the waters from the earth? Notice, Proverbs 8, 29. I'm reading from the NIV in most of these because the NIV is clearer in the translation. When he gave the sea its what? Boundary, that's the same word ordinance, hook. When he gave the sea its boundary, so the waters would not overstep his command. See, does the word hook have to do with the divine command established at creation? Yes. And when he marked out the foundations of the earth. Another text that is similar to this one is Job 38 and verses 8 through 11. Who shut up the sea behind doors, when it burst forth from the womb. In other words, at creation, the planet was covered with water, right? There was, no, there was no limit to the waters. So, who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed limits. Fixed limits is once again hok. So is this a divine command established at creation 
for posterity's sake, absolutely. And then it says, for it and set its doors and bars in place. When I said, this far you may come and no farther, here is where your proud waves halt. But the word hook also has to do with ordinance, an ordinance that God gave for the heavenly bodies to fulfill their functions and to stay in their orbits. Notice what we find in Psalm 148 and verse 3 and verse 6. Praise ye him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you stars of light. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He set them in place forever and ever. He gave what? A hook, a decree that will never pass away. So God established this command for the heavenly bodies at the beginning. He also, after the flood, established the, the rain cycle. Notice Job 28 and verses 25 and 26. When he established the force of the wind and measured out the waters, when he made a decree, once again the word chok, for the rain and path for the thunderstorm. So God, did God establish the seasons when it would rain? He most certainly did because he's the creator. God's decree also guarantees the regularity of the seasons. Notice Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 24. Jeremiah 5 and verse 24. They do not say to themselves, Let us fear the Lord our God, who gives autumn and spring rains in season, who assures us of the hoke weeks of harvest, the regular weeks of harvest. Did God establish the agricultural cycles? He most certainly did. So the word hoke, which is translated ordinance, actually deals with decrees that the Creator gives for nature to behave in a certain way. By the way, do you know also that the covenant is chok, is perpetual? Notice 1 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 17. The covenant he made with Abraham, the oath he swore to Isaac, he conformed, confirmed it to Jacob as a chok, that is, as a decree, or as an ordinance, if you please, to Israel as what kind of covenant? As an everlasting covenant. Does God change his covenant? No. Notice Psalm 89 and verse 34. God later promises to David, My covenant I will not break nor alter, interesting word, nor alter the word, word that has gone out of my lips. So God engraved the Ten Commandments upon tables of stone with his own finger to emphasize their permanence and unchangeable nature just like, like the decrees that he gave for nature. Notice Exodus 32 and verses 16 and 17, speaking about the tablets of the Ten Commandments. Now the tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, and now notice what the word is used, engraved on the tablets. Is that the meaning of the word chok, according to the experts in the Hebrew language? Absolutely. Now, the next page, page 256. The change of the ordinance reminds us of the little horn in Daniel 7, verse 25, who intended to change God's law. Would that be kind of like changing God's ordinance? that he established at creation? Absolutely. We are reminded that the root meaning of the word chok is to etch or to engrave. What change did the papacy attempt to make in the law that God engraved on tables of stone? You know the answer to that. The divine command to what? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, which he established when? At creation. And here's the interesting thing. He established it at creation as a perpetual thing for the human race as long as time should last and even into eternity. Because God created in Genesis the week. And the weekly cycle has continued 
perpetually, week after week after week, according to the hulk of God at creation. So we find here that the papacy thought that it could change one of the commandments, the ordinance that God placed in the Ten Commandments that he etched into the tablets of stone. By the way, the papacy, at least the present papacy, has also changed the other ordinance that God established at creation because he established besides all of the weather ones and you know the water's not going out of their bounds he established another ordinance in the garden of eden and that was marriage between a man and a woman do you know that pope francis the first they did a documentary on netflix on him and he actually came out and he says that he believes that there should be civil unions and that homosexual couples should be able to raise children. So the papacy has not only meddled with the commandment to keep the Sabbath, it is also in the process of changing the other ordinance that God established at creation. Now let's read what Ellen White had to say, the little lady. Did she understand this? She most certainly did. Let's read a series of statements now from the writings of Ellen White. This is uh, Testimonies on Sexual Behavior, Adultery, and Divorce, page 159. Marriage was from creation, constituted by God a what? A divine ordinance. The same word that we find in Isaiah. She continues, the marriage institution was made in Eden. And now what other she, does she talk about? The Sabbath of the fourth commandment was instituted in Eden. When the foundation of the world were laid, when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Then, let this, God's institution of marriage, stand before you as firm as the Sabbath of the fourth commandment. Does she mention two ordinances that were established at creation? Yes, and she uses the word ordinance. Let's notice the next, the next quotation, Desire of Ages, page 281. The Sabbath was hallowed at creation as what? What's the next word? As ordained for man, it had its origin when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Early writings, page 217. Are these commands of God that can be altered or changed? No. They are creation ordinances. Notice early writings, 217. I was shown that the law of God would stand forever. By the way, do you know what the ancients usually wrote on? They usually wrote on parchment or on tablets of clay. You know, in the Middle East, archaeologists have dug up thousands of tablets, and the tablets have kind of fallen apart because they were, they were written on tablets of clay. But the Ten Commandments were not written, were not engraved on tablets of clay. They were engraved on tables of what? Of stone, because stone is permanent, as permanence. So notice, I was shown that the law of God would stand fast forever and exist in the new earth to all eternity at cr the creation when the foundations of the earth were laid. The sons of God looked with admiration upon the work of the Creator, and all the heavenly hosts shouted for joy. It was then that the foundation of the Sabbath was laid. I saw that the Sabbath will never be done away, but that the redeemed saints and all the angelic hosts will observe it in honor of the great Creator to all eternity. So when was the Sabbath established? At creation. It was engraved on tables of stone, and it will exist to all eternity. And that's what Isaiah chapter 66 uh, and verses 22 and 23 tell us, from Sabbath to Sabbath, the redeemed will go to worship before the Lord. Notice the next uh, quotation that we find at the top of page 257. Who created the week? You know, God not only created things during creation week, he created time measurements. Did God create the month? Yes. Did he create the year? Absolutely. Did he create the day? Did he create the week? Yes, God created 
not only things, material things, he also created measures of time. Has the week ever been interrupted? Or has the week continued as God established it, the ordinance that he established that creation, has it continued all the way to our day? It has continued. Notice this statement. Like the Sabbath, the week originated at creation and it has been preserved and brought down to us through Bible history. God himself measured off the first week as a sample for successive weeks to the close of time. Like every other, it consisted of seven literal days. Six days were employed in the work of creation. Upon the seventh, God rested, and he then blessed this day and set it apart as a day of rest for man. Notice what we find in Selected Messages, Volume 3, pages 318 and 319. All those who hold the beginning of their confidence firm unto the end will keep the seventh day Sabbath, which comes to us as marked by what? As marked by the sun. Now, there's a controversy. You know, people always ask this question, and, uh, you know, it's not rocket science to answer the question. They say, uh, did the sun exist on the first day? Because the fourth day it says that God made the heavenly bodies. By the way, that word is asa, which means that he, that he formed or he organized. It's the same word that's used for a, for a potter who's making a vessel. He's taking something that already exists and he's giving it form. He's forming it. What happened on the fourth day was that God placed the sun, moon, and stars to uh, create uh, seasons and to create months and to create the different uh, seasons of the year. That's what he did. But the sun already existed the first day. And you say, now wait a minute, how do you know that? For this following reason. Notice this statement from Ellen White. She wrote, uh, this is in um, Selected Messages, Volume 3, 318 and 319. All those who hold the beginning of their confidence firm unto the end will keep the seventh day Sabbath, which comes to us as marked by what? By the sun. What did God say after each day of creation? It was the evening and the morning of the first day. What marks the evening? What marks the evening? The setting of the sun. What marks the morning? The rising of the sun. So was there a sun the first day? It was the evening and morning of the first day. So there must have been the sun there. Now I'm not going to get into the scientific explanation and work this out now. But what I want you to notice is that God established seven days of 24 hours. He worked six, six rested on the seventh day, and then he commanded Adam and Eve to keep the next Sabbath after six days of work and to do it perpetually till the end of time and even into the new earth. Notice signs of the times, September 14, 1882. The creator of the heavens and the earth commanded, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. This command was enforced by the example of its author, proclaimed by his own voice, and placed in the very bosom of the Decalogue. But the paper, now listen carefully, uh, change, remember the word change, the ordinance? She wrote, but the papal power has removed this divine ordinance. Does this have anything to do with uh, the passage in Isaiah chapter 24? Changing the ordinance or removing the ordinance or altering the ordinance? Absolutely. So once again, but the papal power has removed this divine ordinance and substituted a day that God has not sanctified and upon which he did not rest, the festival so long adored by heathens as the venerable day of the sun. And then speaking about the Sabbath, notice how once again she uses the word ordinance and then she refers to the papacy and uses the word changed. She says in a Great Controversy 452 and 453, the prophet thus points out the ordinance which has been forsaken. What is the ordinance that has been forsaken? She's talking about the Sabbath. She quotes scripture. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, 
the restorer of paths to dwell in. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, not finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. Notice that she calls it the divine ordinance once again. Notice how the statement ends. This prophecy also applies in our time. The breach was made in the law of God when the Sabbath was, uh, what? Is that in Isaiah chapter 24? Yes. Is the word ordinance in Isaiah chapter 24? Yes. This, she says, the breach was made in the law of God when the Sabbath was changed by the Roman power. But the time has come for that divine institution, which is the ordinance, to be restored. The breach is to be repaired and the foundation of many generations to be raised up. Are you starting to catch the picture? Would God consider a violation of the Sabbath and heterosexual marriage as reason to destroy the world for its immorality? Absolutely. Now here's an interesting point on page 258. Conservative Christians today fight tooth and nail to defend marriage between a man and a woman. Right? The Bible Belt Christians. They defend marriage tooth and nail. And when you ask them, why do you defend heterosexual marriage? Why can't two individuals who are of the same gender get married? They say, well, because at creation God established marriage between a man and a woman. And then I tell them, and what else did he establish at creation? It's, it's incomprehensible how they will fight to restore marriage, which was made at creation. And they do not fight to restore the Sabbath, which was equally made at creation at the same time. This kind of double talk must come to an end. I challenge Bible-believing Christians to restore both creation institutions as God originally made them. After all, both of these, and this is important, why does Satan hate marriage and he hate the Sabbath? Because both of these institutions are symbols of the relationship between God and his people. If marriage is still a symbol of that relationship, why not the Sabbath? Is the Sabbath a sign of the intimate relationship between God and his people? Yes. Is marriage used as a metaphor for the intimate relationship between God and his people? Yes. So would Satan want to destroy both because they point to the relationship between God's faithful people and their God? Absolutely. That's why Satan hates these two institutions. That's why everybody today is out there playing and shopping and listening to and watching sports on television, listening to secular music. The devil has done a pretty good job. You know, when you go out there, you say, is it Sabbath today? The only way that you know that it's the Sabbath is here because you're here in church. But you go out there, it's just like any secular day. The devil has done his homework. You forget the Sabbath and you forget the Creator. Because the reason for the Sabbath was to remind us every week that God is the Creator. Now, the third reason why God destroys the earth and why the earth became extremely immoral. The third sin that will defile the world and cause its destruction is the breaking of the everlasting covenant. There is only one everlasting covenant that the Father made with His Son in eternity past. The agreement was that if man sinned, God would provide a substitute to restore man to his original condition. Now the word covenant has two aspects. The first aspect is covenant law, and the second is covenant sacrifice. Let's read about covenant law in Deuteronomy 4, verses 12 and 13. It says there, And the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. Here Israel is being addressed. You heard the sound of his words, but saw no form. You only heard a voice. So he declared to you his covenant, 
which he commanded you to perform. And what is the covenant that he commanded Israel to perform? That is the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone. So what is the covenant? The covenant is the Ten Commandments written on tablets of stone. But that's only half the, half the truth. Because God also established the ceremonial system, which is part of the covenant. What was the purpose of the ceremonial system? The purpose of the ceremonial system was when people transgressed the law to provide a way in which their sin could be forgiven. In the Old Testament, it was through ceremonies and sacrifices, shadows that pointed to Jesus Christ, the reality. So the purpose of the law is to point out our sin and to say, I only can condemn you. I cannot save you. However, because you are sinful, go to Jesus. And he has shed his blood, and he will forgive your transgression of the law. So you have covenant law that points out sin, and you have covenant sacrifice which takes care of the sin. But God not only wants to justify people. God not only wants to forgive sin. God wants to empower people to live in harmony with the law of God. What is the new covenant that is perpetual? Does it have anything to do with the law? It most certainly does. Notice what we find in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 10 through 12. Hebrews 8, 10 through 12. And by the way, I want you to notice here that uh, Paul, whom I believe is writing the book of Hebrews, actually refers to the Christians as Israelites. <laughs> it says there in verse 10, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws, where? In their mind, and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor, and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. So what does God want to do? He not only wants to forgive sin. When we transgress the law, the law says, you're guilty, you deserve to die. But then the law says, turn to Jesus, he bore your penalty. And so when I repent of my sins, truly, and I confess my sins, and I trust in Jesus, Jesus takes his righteousness and he places it to my account, and God looks at me as if I'd never sinned. But if I truly understand the serious depths of sin, and what sin cost Jesus, through the power of God, I will want to stop sinning. You know, uh, W.D. Frazee, who established Wildwood Institute, gave an illustration in his little book, Ransom and Reunion Through the Sanctuary. He said, what would happen if you had your hand on a red hot, hot bur stove burner, and you say, oh, it hurts, oh, it's so painful, it hurts, and your hand is still there. It must not hurt enough, right? The same way if I say, oh, sin hurts, oh, it's so painful, but I keep on doing it, it must not be painful enough because I don't see what it cost Jesus. Are you following me or not? So the end time generation will break the everlasting covenant. In other words, they will be transgressing the law instead of receiving forgiveness as well as having the law written where? In our hearts. Now, who does the works in us? It's God who does the works in us. Let's read some verses here. Isaiah 26 and verse 12. Lord, you will establish peace for us. You have also done all our works in us. So when the law is written in the heart, who is it that does the works? God does. Because the law is a reflection of God's what? Is a reflection of God's character. Notice Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So, and the next verse is going to apparently say the opposite of, of verse 12. What does the next verse say? For it is God who works in you, in you, because the law is written in the heart, it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. 
So when the law is written in our hearts, because we behold Jesus, because we behold his sacrifice for us, God works in us. And it, it, it explains it as working out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Notice Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. And most Christians stop right there when they're reading the book of Ephesians. They say, see, it's not of works. So I don't really, God doesn't care what my works are. Now wait a minute, you've got to read verse 10 too. For we are his workmanship. This is talking about creation and redemption. This is speaking about the creation of a new heart. Did David pray for a new heart? He most certainly did. Notice, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. And who prepared those good works? We did it through our own efforts, right? No. It says, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. When the word walk is used figuratively in the Bible, it means conduct or behavior. Notice Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. Once again, works flow from a new covenant relationship. It says, now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you what? What does the blood do? It makes us complete in every what? Good work to do His will, working in you what is well-pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. What a beautiful verse. Now the question is, how can this be done? Isaiah 26, verses 1 to 3, has the secret in one little word. In that day this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. In the end time, what is that city? We've studied this morning. Jerusalem. We have a strong city. God will appoint salvation for walls and bulwarks. Open the gates that the righteous nation that what? Keeps the truth may enter in. And then notice this. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is, here's the key word. What's the key word? What does stayed mean? It means dwells, remains, abides. A constant beholding, if you please. You will keep in imperfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Our mind must be stayed on him. We do not become like Jesus by merely glimpsing or glancing at him. But by lingering and dwelling on him and his character. The Apostle Paul explained it this way. 2 Corinthians 3.18 but we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being what? See, it's a continuous verb, tense. We are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. The more we behold, the more we are changed. That's why Ellen White said that we should spend the thoughtful hour contemplating the, the life of Christ, particularly the closing scenes, because there we see how much sin costs. When we visit Gethsemane and we see Jesus sweating drops of blood, and we see the Lord Jesus crying out to his Father, Father, if you could take this cup of your wrath from me, do it, but your will be done, not mine. And we hear Jesus crying out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we ask Jesus, why did this happen to you? And Jesus says, because of your sin. Are we going to look at sin differently when we see what sin did to Jesus? Yes, and we'll only know what sin did to Jesus is if we dwell and we abide in him and we keep him in our mind. You remember the experience of Moses, right? He went up to the top of Mount Sinai and he was in communion with the Lord for 40 days. What happened when Moses, by the way, he said to, to the Lord, show me your glory. You can read this in Exodus 33, 18, and 19. And also Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. Did God show him his glory? Was it a glorious light? 
No, what did he show him? He showed him his character. And what happened with Moses when he came down from the mountain? His face, you can read this in Exodus 34 verse 29, his face was shining. His face was radiating the glory of God because God's glory is contagious. Now notice how Ellen White expressed this. Sons and daughters of God, page 337, by beholding Christ, by talking of him, by beholding the loveliness of his character, we become changed. Why is the world being changed into the devil's image? Because they're watching too much television. Because they're watching too many Hollywood movies. Because they're watching the news where you have violence and you have, uh, you know, these demonstrations for gay rights and gay marriage and so on. They're becoming conformed to the world because we are what we look at. We are what we listen to. It's a law of life. Like we are what we eat physically, we are what we eat spiritually through our eyes and through our ears. And what is the condition of the world going to be at the end of time, folks? People are going to be transgressing the covenant because they don't have the covenant written where? They don't have the covenant written in their hearts. So she says, by beholding Christ, by talking of him, by beholding the loveliness of his character, we become changed. Changed from glory to glory. And then she asks the question, what is glory? Character. And he becomes changed from character to character. Thus we see that there is a work of purification that goes on by what? By beholding Jesus. Incidentally, do you know what word is the Apostle Paul uses when he says that we are being transformed into the same image? It is the word in Greek, metamorpho'o. What word do we get from metamorpho'o in English? Metamorphosis. Do you know what a metamorphosis is? You know, I collected butterflies for many years. And I collected them from the time that the mother butterfly laid eggs on the leaf till the moment that they were in the ca cocoon, till the moment that they came out of the cocoon. It's the most, the most incredible miracle in all of creation. A caterpillar goes into the cocoon. And a short while later, out comes a beautiful butterfly. How did that happen? It's what scientists call a metamorphosis. A radical transformation. That's what Paul is saying. That by beholding Jesus, we are radically changed into his image. And the world is not going to be doing that. So the world will be destroyed. Because they transgressed God's law. Because they changed his ordinances at creation. And because they do not have the law of God written in their hearts. May that not be our experience, is my prayer.